All right, so I get that Uranus and Neptune could have formed them in these residences and pushed some in and flung some out. But what about these? Th these are kind of really out there. I mean, especially things like Sedna and VP113. So the issue with these ones is it's fine to have a large semi-major axis as long as you also have a very high eccentricity. Exactly. Because that means it's a very elongated orbit, but it still comes in close. That's right. Because you remember when you were perturbed by something like Neptune, it didn't change the perihelion, it didn't change the aphelion. Yes. So you'd expect things to move more and more eccentric, larger, larger orbit, but still retain a small perihelion. Yeah. But these things don't. Yeah. So if Sedna is the first and most famous of these so-called detached Kuiper Belt objects, and that's what it looks like, it's a dot. Yeah. Um, and here's its orbit. So there's Uranus and Neptune orbiting the sun. It's really far out. Yes. And this is further out, much further out than Pluto. Yes, so Pluto is about there on the scale. And so it's coming in, so we're now at Aphelion. So it goes out over, so um, Neptune's 30 astronomical units out. Yep. This goes out to about 900 astronomical units. At its uh, aphelion. Furthest aphelion. But that's not surprising. You could expect that. Yep. The trouble is that the perihelion's like 80 or 90 astronomical units. And that's the hard thing to explain. So it's too close. Or it's too far out. Too far out, yes. And right now it's on its way in, it's about here. which If it was out there, we wouldn't have spotted it. Yeah. So in fact, there must be a lot of things like this. Um, we've now spotted a few of these objects, and we always spot them when they're in the closest in point of their orbit. Okay. Because if it was 900 astronomical units, we wouldn't have we a snowball so ahead of seeing it. That's right. But given it spends most of its time in the outer part of its orbit, for every one we see, there must be another 30, 40, 50 that are further out. That's right. So there's actually going to be a lot of these things down here, and we only can see the ones that right in our, in, first of all, highly eccentric orbits happen to be close in. Yep. But the puzzle is that why is the perihelion so far out. That's right. It should be closer if it were really just this migration residence. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we saw that if you're being um, perturbed by something close in, that leaves the perihelion where it is and moves the aphelion out. That's right. But that can't produce these things because their perihelion's moved out. Yeah. So you think maybe they just formed out there. Maybe they were born out. Maybe. But the trouble is they should then be in a circular yeah, orbit. Why, yeah, why, orbit. Would they, why would they now come in? Yeah, so we're kind of stuck. If they formed out there, then there's no reason to have a close perihelion, but also they should be in circular orbits. Something needs to perturb them to put them in an eccentric orbit. But if the only thing we know about that could perturb them can't possibly put them in that orbit. So could something else perturb them? Well, this is the puzzle. Um, and this is our current best guess at having a planet X uh, we've seen the transit between objects are too small, yep. but a lot of people are now thinking that we need something else out there, which we haven't seen yet, to change the orbits of these things to bring the perihelia out. And so in order for this to happen, it has to be on the outside, not the inside. Anything that's perturbing it on the inside will not change the perihelion, only change the, the aphelion. Yes. So what I've done now is I've got the sun, our object in elliptical orbit, and I've put something big, a planet X, out and maybe a thousand astronomical so units out. out. Yep. Yeah, so it's way too far. And we'll see what effect it has. So here we've got our object, it's uh, in an elliptical orbit. And at the moment, this mysterious planet X is a long way away. Yep. But now they're getting close and it's giving it a uh... boost now. And you see now it's bumped its energy up, so its perihelion's moved outwards. That's right. And as time goes on, it might do this again. I went over the other side of its orbit, it's not going to do very much. Yep. But if you look at it, there's going to be another close encounter here. now. Yeah, it's going to be soon. So now this should go further out? Yep. And it does. So these. This is, this is hugely exaggerated. I've given this yeah, thing yeah, far yeah. more mass to be make it so we can see it in a few orbits. This will really take thousands of orbits to happen. But the, this, this is kind of hinting that maybe there's something massive way beyond these objects, yeah. or most of them. And we're not just talking a little bit beyond it, it's we're talking way beyond it, and it would have to be pretty big. Yeah. So here's, here's the basic cartoon view of how something like Sedna and the other detached Kuiper objects came to be. They would have started off, so that's say Neptune, and that's our object forming in this protoplanetary disk. Yep. And they would have formed, like everything else in a protoplanetary disk, in a nice, circular, non-inclined, non-eccentric orbit. But it would have been perturbed after over time yep. by 
Neptune, maybe as Neptune migrated until it was in elliptical orbit. Yep. So now it's in a standard scattered Kuiper belt object orbit, much like Pluto all and Eris and all ones. those other objects. And as time went on, it's going to have close encounters when it's further in. And that could have brought it inwards, in which case it might end up like Triton or a centaur. But in fact, it pushed it outwards. Yep. Probably 50-50. Half of them went out, half of them went in. The ones that it went in mostly got swallowed, apart from Triton and the few centaurs. But this one got scattered out, which kept it safe for a while. And eventually, its aphelion got so far out, it started getting close to this mysterious, unknown planet X that was out at maybe 1,000 or 2,000 astronomical units uh. out. So then this starts to now affect the orbit of this object. Yes, and this pulls it. And again, it could have two effects. It could pull it in, yep. in the middle, in which case it's going to hit something and get swallowed and scattered out, or it can push it out. That's right. And the only ones we see are going to be those that were pushed out, because if they were pushed in, they probably got swallowed and hit something right. billions of years ago. And so the idea is a perturbation by this mysterious planet X brings the perihelion out, yep. and now it's in an orbit like Sedna. Mm. So now its perihelion is far enough away that it's not affected by Uranus and Neptune, and it can probably sit in an orbit like this for billions of years. So now we've kind of seen, obviously, that this model works, right? Because it works for the asteroid belt, it works for most of these things like Pluto, it even works for Triton. So if this does explain why Sedna and a few others, and probably more, are like that, is, is, is there another planet out there? It kind of seems right. Every time we predict something, we kind of find it. Well, sometimes you don't just find what we're expecting, like with Pluto. True. But at the moment, this is where we're at, that this is the best evidence for another planet. Um, we haven't seen it because it's not just a little bit beyond Pluto. Remember, yeah. the Earth is one astronomical unit from the Sun, Jupiter is five. Uranus at about 20, Neptune at about 30, Eris is 40 or 50 or something like this. Sedna at its closest is 80 and its furthest is like 900. Yeah. So this planet X that's out there is out at maybe 1,000 yes. astronomical units. And people have tried to model this and it kind of looks like putting something with maybe sort of Earth mass-ish mm. out at about 1,000 astronomical units would pretty much do the job. It's not going to affect anything close enough in that we can see it, but because it's so far out. But what it will do is it will stir up some small fraction of Kuiper objects that have already gone through this whole cartoon. They've already been pushed out that's to highly right. eccentric orbits, and then it can detach them. So that means bringing their perihelion far enough away that they're beyond the range of the planets. But so if this thing is a thousand times further out than the Earth is from the Sun, it's going to be a tad faint, right? Yeah. Now. If it was as big as Jupiter or Saturn, Jupiter or Saturn, remember, glow all by themselves yes. at infrared wavelengths. That's right. Um, they're hot enough that they are glowing. And so if it was something like Jupiter or Saturn, at visible light, it would be impossible to see because the light has to go all the way out there and all the way back, which means it's going to be unbelievably faint. Yeah. But if it was a Jupiter or Saturn-like thing, we could look at infrared Very telescopes, much, yep. and infrared telescopes have looked for these things. And, and, and they not... find, yeah, they find lots of things out there, but they don't find this. Yeah. So uh, lots of infrared sources are seen. Um, when the first infrared satellite IRS went up, it discovered these strong sources. People thought it might have been some you know, uh, killer star on the outskirts of our solar system. We'll come back to that in the comments section. Yes. It? But it turned out to be distant galaxies that were producing huge numbers of stars. Um, but it can't be a Jupiter or Saturn like thing. It has to be small enough that it's not glowing by its own light. So it has to be somewhere between an Earth and a Neptune, ultimately, in that range. Yeah, or maybe a little bit smaller than Earth, but yep. some, probably something Earthish, maybe double Earth or half Earth or something like that. Yep. We don't know enough of these things, and we don't know their orbits precise enough to be able to really nail it down. Mm. But it looks like something in certain parts of the sky with that sort of property could do the trick. The trouble is it's going to be very faint. It's going to be about 26th magnitude, and that's yeah. beyond... I mean, that's pushing the limits of even the biggest telescopes in the world we have right now. And those telescopes look very intently in very small parts of the sky. We need to map the entire sky, well not entire sky, they have some idea of where it's going to That's be. Right. They've done the same sort of calculation that Leverrier did and said it's going to be over there, but the over there is a very big area. The trouble is, over there in 26th magnitude, you're going to need a very big telescope with a very long exposure time over and over again. Yes. It's a really big ask. It might just be possible with the... Uh, the the, the Vera Rubin Observatory. And look, and people are looking for this, right? I mean, yep. this is such a, a hot topic, and because that prediction kind of makes sense, there are a lot of programs trying to see can they find anything or 
narrow down the search area. And it's hard. It's hard. Uh, maybe we need a new generation of telescopes. Maybe someone will announce it tomorrow and we'll have to rewrite this video before the course <laughs> goes live. Hopefully not, but maybe so. So we started this whole section off by saying, what's beyond Neptune? The answer is a lot. A lot. Planets, not really. The current planet is very interesting in its own right. Yep. Um, but there may still be planet-like things out there, but if so, it's sort of earthy mass, about a thousand astronomical units out, and it's going to be very hard to see. 